Hey, welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Duran Bethay. Duran, I am super excited to talk with you. Had a good time the other day at your bowling charity event. The things that you're doing and just in the community and just with your businesses and how you give back is just amazing. I'm super excited to have you on this show and share what you're doing. So thanks for joining me. Oh, man. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I'm going to kick this thing off the same way I kick off every episode, and we want to have the listeners learn more about you. So if you could share a little bit about yourself, share your story. Who is Deron Bethay? All right. I don't want to go too deep because it is a long conversation, but Deron Bethay, born in Enfield, North Carolina, got us one of those guys just like anybody, come from that small town, not a lot of resources. At my conference, I gave a little bit about Enfield being poised town in the state of North Carolina. And that's based on Ford Magazine. But that's where I come from, a small town American, got a second chance in life. Trouble kid coming up, just wrong place, wrong timing or wrong crowds, whatever the case may be. But I got a second chance. I left my hometown and joined the military where I left 2000 and deployed to Korea with my first leaving home, never rode a plane. And I joined the United States Army at the age of 19. By the time I landed in Korea, I was turning 20. I got there actually two days before my birthday. And that's like how I got started. Went through the military. I'm currently right now transitioning out the military. I got a beautiful family, four girls and a boy. Me and my wife, we dual military, you no know, chief warrant officers. Started out as an enlisted. I switched over. I was a drill sergeant. Then right after I came out the trail as a drill sergeant, I became a, a warrant officer. And at that time, both as an enlisted soldier in the United States Army, I deployed to Iraq, to Afghanistan. Also as a warrant officer, did deployment. And during those deployments, man, it's pretty much when you deploy and something happened that I saw was that I had a good friend that he did 20 years, 22 years in the military. And just like most people in the military, you know, what they do, it was my same business plan, what I had. I was like, hey, I'm going to get out the military, go get a GS job and land some GS-12, GS-13 job, a government contracting job and go get more money and retire and get everything else. Right. But I had his friend. And my last deployment, and uh, he just retired. And I, you know what? He didn't make it home. And the reason he didn't make it home because he ended up retiring, came in as a, I believe he was a contractor, deployed to Iraq, and he just didn't make it back. He was there six months. And at that point, that light bulb came off in my head was, you know what? I got to do something different. I don't want to change my plan. And that's when I came up with my own thing. And I created my own investment group called Bands of Brothers Investment Group and didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I just pretty much was reading books or whatever the case may be. Only thing I knew that is I didn't want to continue to do the same thing that I saw everybody else do. I want to do something different. And at that point, even back then, I was I was in tune with investing. I was self-taught. And I started investing my whole my, almost my whole military career because I had a mentor that kind of pulled me to the side, which was a command sergeant major. Been in the army. I was only in the army probably in career less than a year. I was find myself in trouble again. And I thought I was going to get put out the military. And I had got a second, my other opportunity was in the military where I got a second chance. Got into an issue downtown and got pretty bad. And I went to the side major and I pretty much asked him, he was like, hey, do you know, why should I keep you in my army? And I told her, I said, put, kick me out. I'm going to go back to the small town. And this was, this was my surroundings or whatever the case may be. And instead he said, you know what I'm going to do to you? I said, yes, you're going to put me out. He said, no. You see that office you just walked through? That's going to be your office. You're going to come work for me and whatever the case may be. So that's how I got my mentor. I stayed working from him from E2 all the way up to E6. He promoted me, took me. When he left, every deployment that I went on, I actually went and deployed with him. And that's like how I got started. And on that last deployment, I decided that I was going to start my own business. And that's what I did. So once I started it, again, I didn't know exactly you know, what it do. So I started reading books and I started writing pros, cons, and all these things. So I said, you know what? I'm going to create an investment group. And I came up with a name, Bands of Brothers Investment Group. And I just like the movie. I used to be on HBO or the series that just come on. And I really like that. And I said, all right, I'm going to be Bands of Brothers Investment Group. So I got, just like anybody else, everybody want to bring their closest friends or who they know and trust and, you know, we could talk a little bit about that later, but everybody can't go. But I presented it, got back from deployment, went to St. Lucia's, 
we brought the wires and all that. And I had this PowerPoint. I pretty much create a PowerPoint presentation and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. I already did the homework research. We're going to be able to save. Everybody going to save X amount of money every month until we retire 2022. All right. That was the plan. Save. We ain't going to do now. We're going to work when 2022 get here, which is this year right now, because this is a year that I'm transitioning out of the military. We're going to go in business. We're going to open this business and blah, 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 blah. All right. What happened was that you stepped outside and went out and opened a business way ahead of time. And I and my guys, they wasn't ready because at that time, everybody didn't have the funds. But again, I started investing with stock market. I was self-taught and I just started investing at a young age. So I had the capital to actually go open up my first business. And I opened up my first business and got an opportunity. Oh, by the way, my first business was horrible. It was a terrible thing. And we can talk about that later. But I kept on moving. I got a second chance as I was burning money in the red. I doubled down, right? And opened up a second location because if you're gonna if you're gonna lose, you might as well lose big. And at this time I brought my guys that was on the sideline and say, guys, I need your help now. We can't wait to 2022. Let's get in a fight. You know what I'm saying? I have the money. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. And I need to stop the burn. The only way I can stop the burn, when you're burning that type of money in business, you got to figure out another business that you can open up that's going to generate those, those type of losses that I was taking. I was losing anywhere from $8,000 to $10,000 a month. What I did was I pretty much doubled down and we started the business plan that I created on that PowerPoint about eight years ago. And that second location became the number one franchise anytime fitness in the state of North Carolina. And we just kept on building. We've been building about two this per year. And we now you fast forward that we are the top operators in that business and just been a phenomenal thing. But that's on the business side. Also, as on the real estate side, I started real estate. That was part of the things of the books that I was reading. A lot of those books that I was reading that talked about just you know, just talked about I was reading books that talked about investing and, and a lot of those stuff that I was talking about investing. I started reading stuff that's talking about business. But everything that I read, they always said real estate, real estate. So at that point, I knew that I had all these different streams of income. I had the investment, the dividends. And I said, you know what? I need to get some rental income. I need to get, I already got certain other types of income. So I just want every stream of income that's out there. I want a piece of it. I went out and started buying tax lien properties, foreclosed properties, fixing those up and owning them, holding them. And, and what I was doing, I was doing things that was in my comfort zone. You know what I'm saying? I was buying properties in Enfield, North Carolina, $8,000, $10,000, dollars because that's what I was comfortable with. Now I was getting good money because I was able to cash flow it. You're renting out four, five, six hundred dollars and you're only paying 10 grand, 12 grand, 20 grand. That was good cash flow. So that's how I started. And after I continue to do a couple of those and I started buying bigger properties and you fast forward and let's give you an example where I'm at today. I got a 60 plus million dollar portfolio of that portfolio, we just single family houses, probably got somewhere around maybe 18, 20. I have to go look at my PFS. I've been doing really well, man. You started with a house that cost me $8,000, then the next house was $50,000, then the next house was $100,000, then the next house was two hundred. dollars And to this day, I don't buy nothing. If it don't cost nowhere, it's somewhere in, a, in the range of a million dollars because those are the assets that I like to have in my portfolio. That's what I pretty much do. I hold and buy bigger, larger assets, class A assets, where a guy like me that come from a class D neighborhood, that's why I was, that's why I was, I was just used to that. And with that, yeah, you do have pain with a class D property. You got the good cash flow, but you're going to have a headaches of the tenants. But you know what? I like class A. That's where I'm at in my life. I am building wealth for my kids, for my family, my trust on nice income producing assets that eventually we'll own all of. And everything in the mainland that I got is paid for cash. I don't, I have every single D and everything I got in Hawaii. I have a note, but I have a lot of property out in Hawaii, which is here in Coalina. I've been buying just this year alone. Seem like I've been buying a property every year, even though rates going up. I don't care because in my head, I know I just want to secure the asset. Rate's going to continue to go up. I let those guys over there talking about 6% is expensive. They need to go check the historical rates and I'm still going to. So I'm going to continue to hold and continue to buy. And when people turn their head, I'm, I'm buying deals. I'm, I'm, I'm getting some good stuff going. And that's on that part. And you having a business and you generate the type of income that you know we're, we are getting through our business, you got to find somewhere to deploy that money. If you don't find a way to deploy the money, you will have a what we call a tax problem. And, you know, one of the things that we do with, and I did very young, 
As soon as that money start coming, we never took a dollar out of our business. We always took the money, redeployed the money, but I was redeploying the money into real assets, assets that real estate. Very early into business, I became an LP where we was taking money, becoming a limited partner to help offset some of that income so that we can get some tax losses and things like that. Pretty much did that kind of, but one day I always knew that I wanted to be a GP because I was always heavily in real estate. And I didn't know how strong I was until maybe three or four years when, when I pretty much started my own real estate company. It's called Bands of Brothers Real Estate Group. But what happened was I ended up leaving that group and my group that I own. I ended up finding Tri-City, who was with Vance and Duke. And I really met Duke first. I met Duke before he even started Tri-City. We was actually at a meetup, me and him. And and I never forget that day. He was in there. And he was all energy. Last, I mean, we we should start our own real estate company. And he was just had a lot of energy, and I was and I had a lot of energy too as well about the business. And I'm like, yeah, man, we should do this, man. And a lot of people just kind of like in tune what we were talking about. And we ended up leaving and part ways. And guess what? He within 12 months, I see him popping up. He, him and Vince started. So I ended up reaching out to them. We talked. And we realized that when you come together sometimes as a team, you get more firepower. It was a good match made. Joining me, I stopped my Bands and Real Estate Group, and I brought my guy, my partner, Bart Folson, on with me over to Tri-City. And we really, me coming on that team, I was able to help bring them five, six years into the future due to my net worth, my liquidity, my resources, people I know, things like that, and vice versa. You know what I'm saying? Me coming on that team was able for me to move quicker. You know what I'm saying? And since then, it's been a great partnership, great partnerships, great team. Everybody that's on Tri-City, every group that, you know what I'm saying, that I'm partners with, we all work really hard. It's just like everybody know exactly what they do. We go out and knock down targets. But since then, man, just... As a GP partner, man, and I serve as the KP, the key principal, the acquisition director. Majority of the time, I raised the most on the team. And it just, again, I could have did my own thing, but going over there and you having guys like, you know, Vince, who is a phenomenal leader and remind me a whole lot of myself on how I, how I do my business with Bands and Brothers. And it's just been just a phenomenal partnership. And like I said, I just, every, it seemed like, shoot, man, I think, I can't, can't even count, man. I think this year we probably closed two or three, three units, two or three multifamily. And last year I probably did five or six. So the year before then, it was more, I've been growing pretty fast. We got over right now. I think I have about a little over a thousand units and just hit that mark. Just what was that? Last week, we just closed on a deal in South Dallas. In fact, within six days, we had two deals in Dallas. And, that's, and I know run that department, the acquisitions, and I'm flying out next week and we're working on something uh, bigger and better. I want to do new developments so on me, developers in San Antonio, and hopefully that's going to be a great meeting when we go down there and hopefully we can get into new development. Yeah, so that's a little bit. You do a lot. I know, you you know, what you want to talk or whatever, man, I honestly had to step back and be like, God bless me. You know what I mean? There's nothing that I don't do. I do it all. I honestly, self-taught, entrepreneur, business, real estate, multifamily, flips, liens, Invest in stock market, whatever, man. People ask how I made my money. I made my money off stocks and trading options and all that stuff was self taught. So I'm really good in that. Like I just told you, I was doing my taxes and I'm really, I love numbers. I love numbers. I understand it. I pay my fair share of taxes, but I don't pay anything to the IRS outside of my fair share of taxes. I understand how that works. And when you're in business, when you, and a lot of people don't understand, like for me, my goal, you probably said, I want to get a hundred sources of income. And I'm, I don't know, I'm probably somewhere around 50 and 60. I've been so busy this year, I got to go back and add them all up. But my goal is a hundred streams of income, and that's going to be probably within the next couple of years. That's just the first point, right? But what people don't understand and why people get more wealthy is because they understand the tax code. They understand that entrepreneurs are forced to continue to open more business because there's a benefit in there. It's either that I'm going to make $300,000 or 200000 for every entity I got and then pay 40% taxes on it, 
or I'm going to take the money and go open up something else and do 100% bonus depreciation and continue to do that. Oh, by the way, as money continue to make more money, I'm buying more multifamily too as well. So, yeah. you know, um, but yeah, man, so that's me, man. Like you mentioned earlier, man, like we got a nonprofit. I believe in giving back. We've been doing that. That was our first fundraising, me and my wife. We actually been for years, we just been funding that through our businesses, personal accounts. And that was our first fundraiser, which was a blast. And I appreciate you and your team for coming out there and kicking everybody. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but no, man, that's that's a little about me. I know it's a lot, man, but whatever yeah, you got to yeah. ask, yeah, cool. All good, man. Catch your breath, catch your breath. <laughs> Listen, so for my listeners right now, for those of you that just heard Deron's story and hearing about his background, this is just tip of the iceberg, right? So I, I had the opportunity to listen to him speak at the uh, Hawaii Millionaire Mindset Conference. And I got to tell you, I've known Duran for a little while now, but when he tells his story, and now he's sitting down right now, right, uh, on this Zoom call, but when he's up on stage telling the story with how animated he gets and how you could see the passion and the drive, right, of what he's really gone through. He hasn't gotten too descriptive about his background and everything, but I can tell you, and I told people that went to this charity bowling tournament with me too, that I said, hey, when I look at Duran, I look at one of those true come up stories, right? That came from nothing to get to where they are today. And that your ears might have been ringing that day. I don't know, man, but I was talking all about you. All good things, I promise. Maybe mostly all good things. No, I'm kidding. But it's really amazing when you see what termination and drive will get you. Because right now, I can tell you, he's never given up and he always kept going. Duran, your story is amazing. That's why I'm so honored to have you on this show as a guest. Just watching the things that you're doing, being in two deals with you myself. It's just, it's awesome, man. Just what Band of Brothers have done, what Tri-City's done. You come in as the key principal for those guys. Now they can go tackle like bigger deals. It's really amazing stuff, man. So I generally appreciate your story. Now I want to just get into what you're working on right now, because I know yes. your goal is a hundred businesses and a hundred streams of income. I know you yes. said you're somewhere in the fifties right now. Let's talk about that a little bit, right? So you started off with, investing in the stock market, right? The thrift savings plan and all that stuff while you were a young E-nothing. Now yeah. you're a chief warrant officer getting ready to retire and transition out. I'm in the middle of transitioning out myself right now too. Also a prior enlisted Mustang. So it's to see what you've done and, and comparison is the thief of joy, right? But I see what you've done and then I'll take myself and say, I feel like I'm doing really big things. And then I look at you and I'm just like, damn, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it just goes to show that anybody can shatter their limiting beliefs if you work at it, right? Absolutely. And that's the biggest thing I want to point out. So you started off Absolutely. with investing, you thrift savings plan, you had a really good mentor. Thank goodness for that, right? Because yeah. unfortunately, a lot of people, young people in the military don't get that good mentorship, right? And they wind up slipping through the cracks and they'll get out and go back to old habits, but you didn't. And you built up from there. So what did that look like? So you built up that you had this capital now, right? Because you were investing, mm -hmm. you got into your first business. What was that process like? As far as the, the first business or building up to yeah, it? Yeah, building up to it, I think we got that because you were investing, right, in the stock market and everything. Actually, how aggressive were you being when it came to yeah. your investments? Hey everyone, Mike with Average Joe Finances. The Real Estate Wealth Builders Conference, aka RubeCon, is on for 2023. It'll be May 4th through the 6th in Phoenix, Arizona at the Sheraton Downtown. I'll be speaking again this year and I want to see you there. This year I'm doing two speaking events, one about growing your investor network through podcasting and the other is about investing while in the military. We have some great speakers lined up so you don't want to miss this conference. Visit Average joefinances.com slash rubcon r-e-w-b-c-o-n or the link in the notes below and use promo code mike for discounted tickets see you there what's going on everybody so today i want to talk to you about buzzsprout the average joe finances podcast recently switched over to buzzsprout and i gotta say i am super happy with the progress our podcast is now on every single major platform and reaching audiences that we couldn't reach before which is just super awesome so thank you to Buzzsprout for being such a great platform. But also I want to say, hey, guys, if you sign up for Buzzsprout and you sign up for one of their paid plans using our link, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card. So go check them out. It's AverageJoeFinances.com slash Buzzsprout. And we'll make sure the link is in the show notes below. Let's get back to today's episode. I was two things, man. That share. Number one is I was very, very aggressive. I was I never had anything. So 
and you never had anything and you understand and start reading and start coming a little knowledgeable saying, listen, hey, you young, it's okay for you to take a little bit more risk and have no bigger risk coming rewards. And I did that. And one thing that I didn't mention, and I think I mentioned at the conference that a lot of people didn't know is you have to, me and my wife, you know what I mean? We're a great team and you have to tighten up your household where if you, if, even if you're single, tighten up yourself. But me and my wife, we lived off one paycheck. We've been living off one paycheck since, shoot, 2000, I think, eight, nine or something like that. But just living off one paycheck, investing that whole entire paycheck into the stock market, IRA, maxing out both IRAs, both TSPs, changing our pay to once a month and things like that. It was pretty, pretty aggressive. Until this day, I'm still aggressive. I have not yet changed anything as far as my allocations or anything like that. In fact, I have increased more with the market down. I've just been, and, and you know what? I'm gonna tell you something, I'm share this with you. I should, I should pray to God that this will happen. I said, man, I'm getting ready to retire. And I was thinking five years, cause I'm always thinking. That's what we do. We always thinking. Five years ago, I was thinking, I'm like, man, I'm beginning at the army in 2022. All right, and when I saw him thinking about it, I said, man, we, I think I need to have a crash. If the market could crash right around the year I retired, it'll work out for me. And guess what? The market crashed. And I've been ready for it. We've been buying. I've been having capitals on the side. As we have some dispositions and things like that. So it's just been great, man, to see that this has actually been a perfect timing for me. Because we know if we do this crash, and that's what may be another 10 years, at that time is when I will change my allocations. But right now, I'm hundred percent in the market. Fantastic. Okay. So when you made that, when you decided to open a business, right? You yeah. had, now you had some capital to play with, right? So you cash out some stocks and everything and open up a business. Now that first business you opened up, was that all, was that the franchise? Was that the oh. first? No, my first business was uh, it's called So Fresh, So Clean Barbershop. That's um, right. Yeah, it was actually a barbershop I purchased. And I told, no, he was a friend of mine, he became a friend of mine. He just cut my hair and he owned a barbershop. But again, people limited belief. He believed that if his wife got on orders and they was going to leave Fort Hood, Texas, right, right outside of Austin and go to San Antonio, she was going to be her first sergeant. He he just believed that the business was going to succeed unless he was in it. And I was like, I never wanted to run no business where I'm in the business whatsoever. So I tried to get him the advice that if I was in his shoes, what I would do, but he didn't take the advice. And I ended up buying that, that location. I made my money back within 10 months and I sold it for four times what I paid for it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So that's a great first start. But I also want to talk about some of the bumps and scrapes and bruises that you got along the way. And you talked about it when you were talk, sharing your backstory. I know about it a little bit more intimately from, from when you spoke at the conference. But if yeah. you could share with us, what was that like when you had your first, I wouldn't call it a business failure, but your first yep. learning it experience. A it was a business with, failure. Business, man. Everybody, I uh, tell people, everybody think that they can do business because maybe they see someone else or whatever the case may be. My my first business failure was my location out in Texas. I thought I was doing the right thing by investing in a strong market, but I didn't do the market analysis like I thought I did. You know, I didn't know the things that I knew now. And I ended up purchasing, went into a center, and it's all about location. The location was good within that location. As you peel back, you peel back everything, the layers. What happened was that number one, we were just in a, in an end cap, our end cap building. At the end cap of the building, we had another building like blocking us, so we didn't have no visibility from the street. That's number one. Number two, when you we didn't do a deep dive analysis of the, and it was one of the most easiest thing, but it hurt me so bad. We didn't do a deep dive analysis. Did we saw the demographics? But we didn't. We looked over the age and find out that we was in a baby boomer community heavily baby boomer community. And when you have selling gym memberships, they have things for seniors like silver sneakers and all these other things that they have at a discounted rate that they get through their insurance company. If you sign a $10,000 a month lease, $6 a membership is not going to go well for you in your business plan. So I really messed that up. I messed the location of the side of the building. And then one of the most important things of this is you got to know your partner. I think that you may think, you never know how someone is once money come involved. Some people come from different walks of life. I come from nothing. My partner came from money. And it, it, for him and his family, it was just, a, it was easy. It may have been an easy, sure, we can write this off taxes because we make enough money anyway. I didn't have that. I didn't have access. I didn't have no, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have nobody. And that kind of, it was more 
disappointed in anything. You know what I'm saying? He pretty much left me with the business and just to let you know, I still own the business to this day. But he still, he left me with that business. And I think we lost about half a million dollars total in that business. And long story now is things changed. I think I told you how I was able to change it around by investing in that second one, bringing my team on, setting my own rules and things like that, KPIs. So all the mistakes that I learned from the first, I put it in my second and I came back and implemented it again. Yeah, so those are some of the things that just, like you said, man, it wasn't I would never probably change a day in my life. It cost me half a million. I never went to college. So I tell people that's my college education is a half a million dollars in business. And there's no professor. Or those guys can't teach that type of experience. I value that. Yeah. And that's why I was saying, like, I wouldn't really call it like a business failure, but it was an educational experience. That's usually what it is when you can recover from that. But you put yourself in a good place where you were able to bounce back and recover. And you opened up that second location. You said, okay, I learned what not to do this first time. We're going to make sure we get the second one right, put it in the right place, get the right team on board. And you did that and went out there and just started crushing it. Yeah. So. Can you tell me the difference between that first one that you opened and the second one? Besides what I just described, right? Yeah. What were some things that you noticed that were different that that Location. led to your success? Yeah, definitely. You know, I knew not to be at the end cap. I knew visibility was more important. I knew that marketing was more important. I knew that you have to spend money like on your digital marketing, on your direct mail. We just put our best foot forward and you're already working in the red when you open a business. And sometimes people are like, man, I'm already in the red. Well, you need to put more money out. You need to burn more so you can get. We just took a different playbook and, and we was at the other location. We said, all right, we're going to have a $1,500 at the first location. We're going to do $1,500 in marketing. This time go around, we did $10,000 in marketing and uh, we broke even doing pre-sales. Store wasn't even open. We broke even. We opened that store up about I think it was about 400 members. So when we opened in the first location, I probably had like 50 members or something like that. And like 48 of them were silver sneakers. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> no, PTSD, that's awesome, man. man. No, Duran, it's amazing just when you look at this and what you've learned and accomplished since then. And then besides the franchises, besides those mm -hmm. businesses, then you got you got yourself involved in real estate, right? I know mm -hmm. you were buying some of those properties back in North Carolina and everything. And then you started getting into bigger stuff, right? Including like buying these properties out here in Hawaii. Hawaii, right. So you're focusing now. I know your goal is to be like the largest private owner in Coalina. Yeah. You're probably really close to being that, if not already there. Yeah, man. Yeah. So can you talk about that a little bit? What was that transition like when you decided to, I know you're still opening businesses, right? And you're still running mm -hmm. those, but what was it like when you decided I'm going to go ahead and start like buying more real estate? Yeah, no, good question. Real estate, you look at that first property that I purchased that was like 13,000. I still own that property and that property never, ever, it's always been a plus, right? So what really made me was, you look at business, it's great. It's great. You can have it, you can pass it down to your kids. But again, your kids may not want to be in that business. But on the real estate side, you know, when you start buying luxury A-class, something that you can pass off, there's nowhere that I've ever been in luxury areas, class A areas, where that property will always continue to appreciate. So it's easy for my kids to have them properties located in class A areas so I can be able to pass that off to them, their trust. And really, they can be as passive and hands off as they want. But, you know, what I'm saying have them some streams of income. If I leave them with the business, they got to be in it. They got to be they got to want to be in it. And then if they pass and say, you know what, we're going to hire a CEO and run this business, they can run that business down. But it's hard for them to mess up. You know, saying great assets and things like that. As I look at my portfolio, what really made me think about it was, I think it was two years ago, I was looking at my tax returns and I'm like, man, I got all this stuff going on. And I said, you know what? Let me look at my tax returns and let me focus. Let me dive, dive deep in my tax returns. And what I did was I focused on what are making me the money? Like what is making me the money? And it stuck out like a sore thong. And it was, it was number one, you know what I'm saying? Vacation rentals was number two. Multifamily was number three. And then my stock portfolio was number four. And I said, you know what? I'm going to continue to focus on building more business, doing more real estate, doing bigger multifamily properties, and increasing my portfolio doing this down market. Yeah, that's awesome. And that was the top four out of everything you had going on too. That's including yeah. your military income and all that. My military <laughs> income is, I wouldn't say it paid for my taxes, but I don't pay taxes. 
That's, crazy. <laughs> That's why I was, you know what? And a lot, a lot of people told me this one thing to me, like for the military people, man. A lot of people said, man, what did you stay? Why did you stay in the military? And I was like, I know, number one, I don't like to start nothing, don't finish. And I didn't ever want to have a regrets. And then I also knew no matter all these streams of income, that income will never, ever, ever stop. And then I always thought that, man, one day I'm going to be able to have this income. But God has something else that I've never thought about that getting out. And like most people, I'm probably going to have some disability or whatever the case may be. But right now, just talking to my my, my attorney as I transition out of the military, I'm looking at not having to pay no taxes on either my retirement check or my disability check. I'm a chief warrant officer. Say I'm getting I'll sure, 8000 a month, whatever the case may be, I think, with my dependents and everything. That's tax-free. You know what I'm saying? That's in my wife. You know what I'm saying? We both are talking four checks coming in the house, 16 grand, all tax free. I can now I can pay my ass amount through my business and I'm being, you know what I'm saying? I could have been a two hundred thousand dollars from earned income and then pay myself another two hundred. Now I got four hundred, but I can still make four hundred thousand dollars by paying myself only two hundred thousand, even though four hundred coming in, because half of that is gonna be tax free. That's a it's a thing of beauty. That's one of the things I like about and one of the reasons why I stayed in Hawaii too. <clears throat> Excuse me, because they don't charge uh, taxes on my pension. Hey, Duran, this has been awesome, man. I want to transition this into something that we call the final round. It's where I'm going to ask you four questions, four of the same questions I ask everybody that comes on this show. And they're hard-hitting questions, but if you're ready to go, we'll, uh, we'll get that party started. Oh, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get it. All right, let's do it. So the very first question I'm going to ask you, and I'll change it up for you in particular, but what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in business? The biggest mistake that I ever made in business definitely not having a mentor. You got to have a mentor. That's the most important part. In, or even in multifamily real estate or just real estate develop, you want to find a mentor. That's going to save you tens of hundreds or not even millions of dollars. Yeah, no, that's huge. That's huge. Having a mentor uh, or sometimes I even talk about it too, having a mentor or a coach. Because And there's a difference between the two. People don't, A lot of times people don't realize that a mentor is somebody that you're going to look up to and they're going to help you and guide you. And you ain't paying them though. A coach right. you're paying. So now a lot of times one of the reasons why I like to use coaches for certain things is it, it gives me that accountability. Man, I just paid this person. I better do something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, right. But then mentors are huge, man, because they're the ones that are going to show you like, no, this is the way. It makes me think about the Mandalorian. You got the Mandalorian, little Grogu, and he's, this is the way. They just show you the way and you go and make magic happen. So I love that, man. Yeah, I had to get a Star Wars reference in. I had to. All right, cool. The next question I have ties into this, but what is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? One thing that I learned that I wish I knew when I first started. So I think I'm, I'm really good at right now is marking market analysis. I wish I would was more in tune with some of the sources that's out there that you can use. But market analysis, I love it. I love watching CNBC. I know anything in the states that I'm tar- like I'm focusing, I can tell you everything about the state. Who's moving there? What is the unemployment rate? What is the household income? All those things, man. Really like I really like that part of business and multifamily is that's really just knowing the area and being able to do it from here. You know what I mean? You don't have to be there. In fact, living in Hawaii, I got businesses in North Carolina, Texas, Arkansas. And I've never been where my business is at. Never. This is the first time ever. And it's like the two locations that I got here. And I've been able to be successful by really diving deep and learning market analysis. Right on. No, I definitely appreciate that. And I appreciate your transparency with your answers. This is all the real sauce. Yep. All right, cool. The next question I have, again, this all kind of ties into each other. And that is, do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started in business today tips and tricks tips and tricks one tip that you should do is i think maybe everybody that when they go into a business they need to do a swap analysis no matter what it is you know what i'm saying that's if you just knew in it just do your swap analysis and go from there and also definitely make sure you are you find a mentor especially in the art of the deal in business is going to be it's probably going to be your lease agreement it's going brick and mortar that's going to, if you get that wrong think about it you're going in you sign a lease agreement anywhere from five years to 10 years and you're doing a personal guarantee saying that hey i personally guarantee my house, my car, my investments that I've been saving 20 years and I'm going to be able to pay you if it don't work out. That's what you tell the landlord. So just make sure to be very aggressive 
doing it when you are going back and forth, trying to come up with a lease agreement or what we call an LOI letter of intent. And again, find a mentor, have them look over it and don't sell them for anything. Don't let the landlord bully you. Be aggressive and ask for what you want and try to limit it, limit it as much as to your personal finances. Yeah, that's where you make the money right there in the beginning. When you start off with that first lease, the lower you can get it, the more cash flow you're going to have, right? Like you said, be aggressive. Very aggressive. Don't be scared to ask. Yeah, I love it, man. All right. So the final question of the final round is, do you have a favorite business, investing, or real estate related book or podcast or both? Okay. All right. So if you're going to go into business... I'll give you a couple of them, actually. <laughs> if you're going to go in business, if you're trying, I'm trying to figure things out, I want to go in business. Maybe I don't want to go in business. Maybe I want to create a real estate group or I want to create a business group or whatever, investment group like myself. Definitely want to read Rocket Fuel and by you know, Wickman. And then he got the book. The second book that you read to go with that is Traction. All right. So Rocket Fuel is going to definitely be for the visionary or the CEO or the founder of the company, maybe. And then your, your right hand man or gal is probably going to be the COO. And those two people definitely need to read that book, Rocket Fuel. And then, like I said, Traction. Everybody in my company at the headquarters level is a requirement that they must and have to read Traction. Everybody. So, you know, that's really big. And then um, as far as investing, depending on where you at and your level of investing, if I think first, if you like me, come from nowhere, it's about your mindset, getting your mindset together first. And you just got to go to those millionaire next door, the rich dad, poor dad, those books right there to set your mindset. And then as far as a podcast, definitely Tri City, the cash flow projects. We do that too as well. So yeah. All right, right on. I appreciate that, Deron. Thank you. Now, that is it for the final round. However, I have one more question for you, and it is the most important question of all. Because my listeners here, they sat here, they listened to your background, your story, everything that you've gone through. We got to talk a little bit about your businesses, some mistakes that you've made, some successes that you've had. And this guy is doing some things, and I want to know more about him. I want to know more about his investment groups, any deals that he might have coming up, because I want to get in with them. So where can people find that information about you? Do you have a website, social media, anything you can share with us? Yeah, my website is bobinvestmentgroup.com. And as far as we also, you can find me on Instagram, deron.bethe. So that's first name, last name. And also Banzer Brothers Investment Group, both on IG and Facebook. So that's where you can find me if you want to get into a deal or you need help. We do even, I know you got a lot of people in the military. I want to definitely you know let you know that every Monday, my team is out at the Career Skills Bridge, or we call it a CSP program, I heard Skills Bridge program. But we also do that. We actually have interns either do the entrepreneurship program, the multifamily program, the franchise program, and entrepreneur vacation rentals. And that my wife, she run that as we have 20 properties here on Coalina. All right. Awesome. Hey, I'm going to make sure I have all those links in the show notes to make it easy for the listeners here. You could just go and click or copy and paste away. Just don't do it while you're driving. I said, hey, Duran, man, this was awesome, brother. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. No, man. Hey, Mike, man, I appreciate it. I know this is probably long overdue, man. And I thank you for having me. Thank you, your listeners. And man, look forward to maybe we continue to do more deals together. Yeah, I appreciate it, brother. Hey, and uh, to my listeners, thank you so much for joining me and our special guest, Deron Bethay on the Average Joe Finances podcast. Go leave us a five-star review and tell us what you liked about today's episode with Deron. Aloha from Hawaii and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances Podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances Podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Thanks for listening to the Average Joe Finances Podcast, your source for beating debt saving money, and investing. Learn more at AverageJoeFinances.com.